Welcome to PowerPoint Tuesday, your weekly deep dive into the Word of God. I'm your host, Pastor Jeremiah, here to guide you through the sacred scriptures with clarity and insight. Get ready for an enlightening journey of faith brought to you through the power of PowerPoint. Let's journey together into the heart of the Bible right here on PowerPoint Tuesday. Amen, amen, and amen. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for giving us another opportunity to study your word tonight. And we ask, Lord God, that as we dive into your word, that you open our hearts, Father God, to have teachable hearts and teachable spirits as we ever endeavor to enlighten our hearts to your word. Father God, illuminate us, illuminate me, speak through me, Lord God, that I may teach your word uh, accurately and according to your will. Father God, we set aside this time for you and we thank you for it. In Jesus' precious holy name, we say amen, amen, and amen. So we finished chapter two last week, and we spent a lot of time on legalism um, and really defining what legalism is. And what we understood is that legalism is really a, a rigid set of rules that really becomes the prerequisite for one's salvation usually finds itself in uh, kind of religious ceremonies and and rituals and uh, certain outward actions that uh, if not done or not done a certain way uh, is makes or breaks your salvation, right? Makes or breaks your relationship with God. Some examples we use in a modern day perspective would be dress codes. Um, you know, how long your dress is, if you wear pants, if you wear makeup, if you wear jewelry, are you allowed to go to the movies? Um, so, so things like that. Um, but what we also learned is that this does not mean that there is not a, a moral rectitude that we must follow, right? Um, what we know about salvation is, uh, as I've said before, and I've used the phrase, uh, we're not saved by works, right? we're saved for works. And so what happens is we become saved through the grace of God and our salvation produces good works. And so uh, we do not expect one to salvation to be defined by how they dress or defined by outward visible activities. But one who claims to be a child of God uh, should expect to look different, act different, speak differently. And so that leads us really right into what we're going to talk about tonight here in chapter three, because um, now we're really transitioning Paul's focus. The first couple of chapters, he's really, number one, praising them for the faith that they already have. Um, But then he is warning them against false teachers uh, who are really trying to dissuade the Christian population from the gospel that Paul has preached to them, a gospel of grace, right? A gospel of mercy through Jesus Christ. And the Judaizers and the Gnostics are really saying, yeah, yeah, you can have Jesus, but you still need to be circumcised. You still need to have some extra level of knowledge. You still need to pray to angels because Jesus was never man on earth. And so we have no right to go straight to him. So so what Paul is warning the people against is uh, these types of false doctrines. But we got to remember, we're dealing with Gentiles. We're dealing with converted uh, Gentiles who come from a Greek culture uh, that is largely based on, their credibility is based on works. Their credibility is based on what they do and what they know. Their credibility and who they are, if they are religious at all, is based on something tangible, right? And then to say, well, you don't have to do this, you don't have to do that, uh, then what's left? What's the alternative, right? So what does being a Christian look like? If the, if the, Orthodox Jews are wrong, and if the Gnostics are wrong, then oh, that begs the question, what does it look like? Well, Paul probably anticipates that question because now he begins to talk about, this is what you should do. I've warned you of what you should avoid. Now I am uh, going to really admonish you and direct you onto where you should go. So let's take a look at the first four verses of Colossians chapter three. It says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. 
For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So we see two things happen. Paul really talking about two sets of things, the the difference between what's above and what's below and the difference between uh, life and death from a spiritual standpoint. So when we see the word if in certain translations like King James and New King James, it's really saying since or considering. So he's already talked in chapter two Uh, establishing the fact that we uh, died to our sins and were raised with Christ. We we, we died in baptism and were raised in Christ. And so uh, considering that, considering what we've already said, since you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. Seek in the Greek is zeteo, which means seek to find. So in other words, you're not looking aimlessly. You're looking intentionally with the purpose of finding something in particular, right? And and so it's it's if if you have something valuable that you want to get a hold of, you are going to consciously and intentionally and and rigorously seek and search for that thing so that you can find it and grab hold of it. So it's very much of an endeavor. Uh, and then we go from seek, seeking to setting. It says set your affection, set your heart, set your mind on things above. Set in the Greek is phroneo, phroneo, which means mentally disposed in a certain direction to be devoted to. In other words, it's not just that you're thinking, it's what you're thinking about. It's not just that you're feeling, it's who you're feeling about. And so what is that? What is that direction that we should be mentally disposed to? Well, that direction is above, above, I know. Literally, it means above or a, a place is above, but it also means the quarters of heaven. And we know that because Paul follows it saying, uh, seek those things which are above where Christ is. Well, where is Christ? He is sitting at the right hand of God. Where is God? Above, right? And so uh, that's the perspective that we need to have. That is the viewpoint that we need to have. Instead of looking straight, we must look up. And let instead of looking at the earth, we must look up, right? Uh, and so, what that means is all they had from a Jewish standpoint, all they had from a Gnostic standpoint, is what they're doing here. What the gospel is offering is what is available there from the standard and from the perspective of where Christ is in heaven. And so, if we want to find Christ, where are we going to? Find him well morally and spiritually and, and uh, uh, devotionally. We will find him above, and so that is where we should look. That is where we should set our hearts. Praise the Lord, Sister Ruth Harrington. It is a blessing to have you on with us this evening. Thank you for joining. And so, since we've been raised with Christ, that means we need to change what we're looking for and where we're looking for it right? Uh, Previously, we were looking for uh, knowledge and satisfaction. We were looking for things on earth to satisfy, to fulfill, to, to fill a gap, to meet a need, and we were looking for it on earth. Well, now that we've been raised with Christ, we've got a different thing to look for in a different place. We were looking for love in all the wrong places, but now we can look for life in all the right places, right? And that's where Jesus Christ is. And he goes on to say, uh, for you died, because you died, we died to self, we died to sin. And so our life is hidden with Christ. In other words, what we uh, all we had available to us was the world right all we had available to us in order to find uh some sort of uh spiritual and emotional fulfillment was the world but now that we are alive in Christ our soul is hidden in Christ from the outward effects of the world right we are protected by Christ uh but while being protected by Christ we are still in this bodily form we are still in the flesh and so uh, our soul and our spirit are hidden from the world uh the protection of Christ. But what we do know is when Christ, who is our life, appears, we will appear with him in glory. So right now uh, we are human beings and spiritual beings. But when Christ appears, we will be fully spiritual beings, right? We will see him 
as he is. Therefore, we will be like him. And that is what we're groaning for. That is what we're looking for. And if we are looking for and striving toward that, we need to live that way. Amen. And so uh, seek and set your affection on things above where Christ is, because you're not going to find what you need on earth. You're not going to find what you need in the world. You're not going to find what you need being offered to you uh, from worldly resources. Amen. It can only be found in Jesus Christ. Now, he goes on to start getting specific, right? Because, you know, then and probably now, you, people may ask themselves, well, really, what what is sin, right? What 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 is it? What specific thing should I avoid so I can check the box and say I don't? I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. Well, Paul gives an example of a list of things, but this these examples are by no means exhaustive, and so we're going to really kind of give also a formula on how we can identify whether something is virtue. Or vice, but he starts by giving this list of things to put to death in your members. First, he says, put to death fornication, uncleanness, passion or lust, evil desire, and covetousness. Well, let's start there because these things focus on what impact us, what impacts self, right? These are things that we do. Uh, uh, for and within ourselves to fulfill ourselves. And so, uh, for example, Paul says in Corinthians, when a person sins sexually, he sins against him his own body, right? And so these things really are talking about uh, uh, for self-fulfillment. Sexual immorality is engaging in sexual activity outside of the confines of marriage, whether you're married or single. If it is outside the confines of the covenant definition of marriage, then it is sexual immorality in whatever form it is, right? Um, uncleanness and, and impurity is moral filthiness or corruption uh, as both a way of thinking and a way of action. A lot of people think, well, you know, you know, I'm just imagining these things. But if you're imagining those things with the idea that if you had an opportunity to do them, then you're doing them right. Um, lust that's or passion. That's an intense and uncontrolled desire for sexual pleasure. Uh, and that can lead to sexual immorality. And so when you have kind of that unchecked self-control um, that doesn't, uh, that, that, that you would really fulfill under forbidden circumstances, if you could, that's lust. Evil desires uh, are cravings for things that are sinful or harmful right? Uh, you, you just need it. You need more of it. You need to, you need whatever it is. You need more food. You need more money. You need uh, uh, more women. You need more men. You need more cigarettes. You need more alcohol. It's, it's the craving of things that will do you harm if you were to get a hold of it and use it in excess, right? And then there's covetousness or greediness. That is the excessive or insatiable desire for material wealth or possessions. It's when you can never had, have enough to the point where you will do whatever is necessary to get it, especially if it's covetous, that means you are desiring what someone else has. You are looking for uh, to get a hold of what someone else has and keep it for your own. These are sins that really negatively impact you, right? But then he goes on to say in verse six, because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. In other words, these behavior prompt God prompt the wrath of God. These behaviors uh, are the reason by which the wrath of God is coming upon men. Now, do you want to be on the on the receiving end of the wrath of God? I sure hope not. And so, so we must make sure that we put off the members, put off the works of selfishness, and that's fornication, uncleanness, passion, lust, evil desire, and covetousness. But then he goes on to say, but now you yourselves are to put off all of these. So he gives another list, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language. Well, these are things that impact others. So there is a 
category of sin that affects you and there is a category of sin that affects others, how you communicate with people, how you treat people, how you engage with people. And if it comes from a place of anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, uh, or filthy language, then Paul says you need to rid yourself of it. Anger, those strong feelings of displeasure or hostility. Uh, and that means really, uh, we're going to get angry, especially if it's a righteous anger and anger for justice. Uh, anger is a natural emotion. But if it's an anger that we can't quell, if it's an anger that lasts for too long, if it's an anger that we can't seem to get past, then we need to check that, right? Then there's wrath, intense or uncontrollable anger or aggression. That anger that results in some sort of uh, uh, aggression towards someone, right? It, it can turn physical. It can turn uh, verbally abusive, right? Uh, that's what wrath is, malice is the intention or desire to do evil or harm to others. So that means you want to do it, right? If you had a chance to get that person back, then you'll do it, right? If 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 I had the means and opportunity to deal with that person the way I want to deal with them, then that's malice, right? Uh, blasphemy or slander, making false and damaging statements about someone. I would even venture to say this includes things like gossip, right? When, when you are talking about someone uh, to someone else, and making false or or false statements or statements loosely based on truth that you don't know 100% of, right? That's blasphemy against them, right? You don't know enough about the situation to decide whether or not such and such is true. And because such and such is maybe I don't know true, then this is the kind of person they are. It, it's not fair to them. And it's not a good characteristic of you. And then there's filthy language, vulgar, or obscene or inappropriate language, you know, that uh, you, you default to things like cussing and cuss words. But, you know, what a cuss word was then versus what a cuss word is now is, is very hard to define. So the question we should ask ourselves when we are engaged in conversation is, is the conversation I'm having, are the words I'm using, is the dialogue I'm engaging in making someone better, right? Is there value in it? Or is it empty? Is it crude? Does it have crude, empty meaning behind it? That's filthy language, right? So whatever that word is, whatever that type of conversation is for you, that's what you need to take into consideration for yourself. So these are the things that we need to die of and these are the things that we need to get rid of, Paul said, because we are alive in Christ and we are to set our affection on things above. I like what uh, Neil T. Anderson says in, in our book, From What Others Say. He says, the law of sin is still strong and appealing, but because our position because of our position in Christ, we can rid ourselves of sinful behavior and habits. Putting to death is to render inoperative the power of sin, something we cannot do in the flesh only through Christ. So, so reminder, being saved doesn't mean you are no longer able to sin. And being saved doesn't mean uh, you are no longer tempted to sin, right? Sin is still possible. But guess what? When we are in Christ and when we are alive in Christ, sin is no longer powerful. That's the difference. Without Christ, sin had power over us and we had the inability to live free from it. But in Christ, sin is still possible, but it is no longer powerful. Praise the Lord, Sister uh, Sharon McCall. Thank you for tuning in with us tonight. So now that we have Christ, we have the power to overcome sin. It, this is uh, Jesus Christ is a resource and a source of power and privilege that we did not have before. Put it this way. If you were in, at one point of your life, a, a financial position where you could not afford a lot of things, therefore you were very limited in what you could buy, what your purchasing power, let's put it that way, your purchasing power was limited because you didn't have the income or the source of income that will provide that. But let's say you came into an influx of cash 
an influx of money by whatever means. Now your purchasing power has vastly increased. Therefore, you can do things that you were unable to do before. You can buy things you were unable to buy before. You can go on vacations that you never had. You can go places you never had. It's the same to do with our moral rectitude. Without Christ, we did not have the power to live the way we ought to live. But now that we have Christ, we have access to the resource that gives us the power to live right with God because our affections are set above. It's an above mindset. And guess what? The reason why we have these warnings against sin is because sin is still possible. Uh, we're going to be tempted. Temptation is not sin, uh, but we have the power to resist and flee from temptation. Well, where do you flee to? You flee above. Temptation comes from the earth. We want to get away from it. We need to go to the destination that we're looking toward, and that is through our relationship with Christ above. And so um, it, it's important that we understand that sin uh, is still possible, but it's not powerful. And we have the ability through Christ to flee from temptation and know that temptation is not sin. Here's another thing to consider when it comes to sin. Um, here's another quote that I found. It's not in our book uh, from Charles Grandison Finney. And he says, both have constitutional appetites, passions, and propensities. And he's speaking of both sinners and Christians. Both have constitutional appetites, passions, and propensities, which are liable to be excited in the presence of those objects to which they are correlated. Hence, both are liable to temptation from these sources. These appetites and propensities have in themselves no moral character in either case. Since they are wholly involuntary, how should they be sinful? A man would be called deranged who should talk of the appetite for food being sinful. But it is as much so as any other appetite, desire, or propensity, whatever. Sin, therefore, neither in the true nor deceived professor consists in these, but in consenting to indulgence under forbidden circumstances. So let me put it simply like, like this, because this is coming in the words from a 15th century revivalist. So it can sound a little complicated. Let's condense the quote to say this. Sin is fulfilling natural propensities under forbidden circumstances. So there's nothing wrong with some of the things that we desire. The virtue or the vice comes in how we obtain it. If we obtain it outside of the framework by which God approves it. Sex is not wrong in itself. Money is not wrong in itself. Ambition for success is not wrong in itself. Nothing wrong with food and other pleasures. All of these things are natural propensities and appetites that uh, we as humans desire and need. However, how you obtain your need for sex makes the difference between virtue and vice. How you fulfill your need for money makes the difference between virtue and vice. If you are engaging in uh, promiscuous sexual activity outside of the scope of your covenant relationship with your spouse or who would be your spouse, then that's where the sin lies, right? You can't sin if you are uh, with your covenant spouse, when you are uh, loving your covenant spouse. But the sin is if you're doing that with somebody who is not your spouse, right? Nothing wrong with money. There's something wrong with stealing money, right? There's something wrong with laundering money, right? Nothing wrong with success, but how do you get there? Are you climbing over people to do it? right? Are you, are you uh, doing things and cutting corners to do it? That's the issue. These are natural propensities. Uh, those are not sin in and of themselves. It is how we fulfill these things that make the difference between virtue or vice. And that's important for us to understand. Uh, so then he goes on to uh, really use this illustration of changing clothes, putting on and putting off. In verse uh, um, nine, he says, do not lie to one another. Since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in Christ, according to the image of him who created him, this is what we need to do. We've died to our sin. We are alive in Christ. That means our old man 
and the old deeds that were with him are dead. Now we are a new man with a new mind. Therefore, we should live as that new man, right? And that new man should be the image, the Bible says, the image of Christ, of him who created him. Image in the Greek is icon, where we get the word icon. It means resemblance. It means likeness. It means derived or it means drawn from. In other words, our new man should look like Christ, right? The old man, Adam, is dead. The new man, Christ, is alive. Now, our new man should resemble and be drawn from Jesus Christ as our example, right? So since our focus has changed and our destination has changed, our behavior should change with it. And so we, we uh, from an illustration standpoint, we are taking off our old dirty clothes and putting on new clothes. He's, uh, a lot of commentators uh, suggest that Paul is using baptism in uh, illustrations, imagery, because uh, part of the ritual of baptism at that time was the person being baptized would go in the water in their old clothes. And then when they were dipped and raised up from the water, they would take those clothes off and be and uh, have a white robe put on them, signifying the new man that they are. And if that illustration is true, it's a powerful illustration because it's really showing uh, how we are shedding of our old self that died and we are putting on the new man and clothing ourselves with the new uh, man that Christ has given us by his grace. Amen. Um, then he goes on to say this in verse 11, where there is neither Jew nor Greek, where there's neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and is in all. So I'm going to say this to you. The gospel is an equal opportunity gospel, right? The gospel is not a white man's religion. The gospel is not a black man's religion. The gospel is not a, a, a British man's religion or a Korean man's religion. The gospel is the gospel and the gospel is for everyone. And it's important that we understand the context by which Paul is really emphasizing this because both Jews and Greeks were exclusionists. They were exclusionists. The Jews would exclude you based on your nationality because you were not a true Israelite. So you were not chosen by the covenant of God. And if you really wanted to, you needed to get circumcised. You needed to follow the Levitical laws. You needed to go through all of these ceremonies. Greeks were equally as exclusionists. They criticized non-Greeks, calling them barbarians. And so uh, or or, or non-Greek speaking people, right? So they were equally as exclusionary and prejudiced as Jews were. And so Paul is really not letting them off the hook in that case. He's criticizing the Jews for wanting to exclude the Gentiles, but he's also uh, criticizing and admonish admonishing the Gentiles for being an exclusionary themselves. Everybody needs to understand that the gospel is for everyone right? Even the people who you used to exclude, this gospel is available to everyone. That's the mystery that is in Christ. That's the mystery that Paul is talking about. And so let's, there are like four categories that we must understand that the gospel is an equal opportunity gospel. Nationality, neither Jew nor Greek in our uh, by our standards today, it could be uh, whether you're uh, American or whether you're British or whether you're at, uh, uh, from a, a nation in Africa or where, wherever it is, that gospel is for you. Whether it's your religious past, maybe you used to be um, a different religion or of a diff different uh, faith tradition or whatever the case may be, and you chose to come to Christianity, circumcision and uncircumcision would kind of be an illustration of that because the Jews would exclude the Gentiles because they were not circumcised and therefore they were not a part of the covenant of Israel. Uh, so, well, I come from this religious past, but I'm in Christ. Well, the gospel is available to you, whether uh, even though you are not Christian, you can still hear and receive the gospel. You are not excluded from the gospel. Uh, cultural background, barbarian or Scythian, as I said, uh, Greeks uh, excluded other non-Greek speaking foreigners, calling them barbarians. And originally that word just meant a foreigner who didn't speak Greek, but it eventually became a more broadly used term to refer to those who were crude and contemptible. And then Scythians were a 
uh, Scythians, excuse me, were a class of barbarians. So they were still non-Greek speaking foreigners, but they were particularly violent, right? And so uh, they went a step further. And, and then uh, socioeconomic status, slave or free, no matter whether you're lower class, upper class, upper middle class, uh, high class, no matter what echelon that you live in, no matter uh, uh, how you dress, how you don't dress, whatever the case may be, the gospel is for you. And he's speaking to a culture who on both sides of it, Jew and Gentile, excluded people based on these classes. And this is what I want to say about that, church. The gospel is for everyone. And we need to stop preaching a gospel that caters to our particular prejudices. We need to stop tailoring a gospel so that it caters to a black agenda or to a political agenda or to a social agenda. We preach the gospel because it's the gospel. And if it's a gospel for it, the gospel, Christianity is not an American uh, ideology. The Bible is thousands of years old. America is 200 something years old, right? And so we need to understand that the gospel we preach needs to work everywhere. If what you're preaching in America can't work in Korea, then you shouldn't be preaching it. If what gospel you are preaching in America doesn't work in Iran or Palestine or Israel, you should not be preaching it. The gospel has to work universally everywhere. And we've got to stop reframing the gospel to make it sound like it's only benefiting a segment of people. Whoever walks into my church, wherever they come from, is going to receive the same gospel because the same Jesus is the one that's made themselves available available to them. Amen. Uh, so that's my soapbox moment for the evening. And so when we think about the new man, now he's really turning into ter transitioning from what we shouldn't do and what we should take off versus what we should put on. And he tells us in verse 12 through 14, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. So this is how we should treat others, right? With tender mercies, uh, compassion, showing kindness and understanding toward others who are suffering or in need kindness, the quality of being friendly and generous and considerate toward others, humility, the quality of being modest and respectful toward others, uh, absent of pride. Uh, uh, humility is really understanding who you are in juxtaposition to God, knowing that you are not God and therefore you need to live uh, a humble lifestyle. Meekness or gentleness, that's the quality of being calm, kind toward one another without harshness or aggression, long-suffering and patience, the quality of being able to tolerate uh, delays, difficulties, or annoyances without becoming angry or upset. Now, this is a characteristic that we all struggle with because there are people in our lives that aren't necessarily sinning, but their personality rubs us the wrong way, right? And it's not them, it's you. You just are not a fan of how this person operates. And they could be doing absolutely nothing wrong. Your personalities just don't mesh. And if you are not long suffering, you could really uh, give off a character and personality and a communication that uh, rubs them the wrong way. And so we need to bear with everyone's idiosyncrasies and shortcomings and characteristics that don't necessarily match ours. We need to be patient with those people uh, because they may feel the same way about you. You've got your own idiosyncrasies. You've got your own personality characteristics that probably rub some people the wrong way. And what we've got to realize is the audience here is a small church, a part of a small new religious movement. And so they only have one another. They've got to deal with a small segment of people because this is a small religious movement. So we got to deal with each other. We've got to love each other, 
right? We can't push each other away just because you grind in your teeth or you don't like the way I talk or whatever the case may be. And, and, and the same is for the church. We've got to be patient and long suffering and bearing with one another. Everybody's not at the same level you are. Everybody doesn't think the same way you are. And so we've got to be patient and understanding with all of our brothers and sisters. And then uh, forgiveness, the act of letting go of resentment or seeking revenge towards someone who's wronged you. And love, this is all secured by love, which is the deep affection and care for others. And Paul says, this is the bond of perfection. And so if we're using clothing as the illustration, then all of our layers of clothing are the tender mercies, the kindness, humility, and meekness, and long suffering, bearing with one another, one another and forgiveness. But love is that outer garment that ties it all together. In other words, if we don't have love, none of those things are sustainable in the long term. We have got to love God and have got to love our brother. It goes back to the scripture in Matthew that I always quote, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and all of your strength. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it to love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all all the law and the prophets. In other words, in order for you to call yourself living out of the commandments of God, it starts with loving God supremely and your neighbor as yourself. And if you do those things, then that will, uh, that will inform how you live. That will inform how you treat others. Amen. It's all secured in love. Uh, and then he really gets ready to close things out with three things that he wants us to do that serve as a fence, serve as a guardrail for our lives, right? He says in verse 15, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which also you were called in one body and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So three things we need to do. We need to let peace rule, let the word dwell, and let Jesus inspire. And by letting peace rule, uh, the word rule uh, really uses this illustration of an umpire or a referee or an arbiter in a sports event. Uh, we look to him to really guide us to make sure our, our, we are playing right on the field. We're following the rules of the game, right? And so the question becomes, uh, using peace as a guardrail or peace as a fence, is anything that I'm doing or saying leading to peace? Is it bringing others peace or is it taking peace from others? Will I have peace with it if I do it? Can I sleep at night if I do it? Would, would God see it as bringing peace, right? Use peace as a guide, as a rule, as a guardrail. And then let the word dwell, uh, let the word influence, let the word be the, the standard by which you live. So it's not enough to just have the word. You got to let the word have you. It's not enough to uh, possess the word. It is let the word possess you, the word of Christ, the teachings of Christ, the gospel of Christ. We need to be hearers and doers of the word. And we need to let the word have a home in our heart. And therefore, the word of God is the source by which we use to help guide and direct our lives. Amen. And we do everything we do in the name of Jesus. But we use the word to teach and admonish one another, right? We shouldn't be taught by the outside world. They're going to want us to go backward. They're going to want us to sin. They're going to want us to fulfill our natural propensities under, under forbidden circumstances. So we can't do that. So who do we lean on? We lean on one another to admonish one another in the word. How do we do that? We preach to one another. We teach one another. We encourage one another. We fellowship with one another in worship through psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Uh, does anybody see themes like this that we've read before? in Ephesians. Some of this stuff sounds exactly like what Paul has said 
in Ephesians chapter five, right? Because it's the same idea. We need to encourage one another, teach one another, instruct one another, worship with one another, amen? Uh, uh, be able to help build one another up through the word of God and the fellowship of the saints. That's why I love worshiping with my congregation because their worship fuels me, right? Their teaching, their passion for the word of God fuels me. And I pray to God that uh, I'm able to create an atmosphere of worship that fuels them because that is what we need if we're ever going to live this life. Amen. And do it all in the name of Jesus Christ. Anything you do, anything you say needs to be in the name of Jesus, in the interest of Jesus. Ask yourself, is what I'm about to do, would it bring God glory? Is what I'm about to say going to bring God glory? Would he bless it if I said it, if I did it? Think of it this way. Would I want to be seen doing it if Jesus came right now? Right? <laughs> if whatever you're engaged in at the moment, if Jesus were to come right now, would he bless it? Would he approve of it? And if the answer is no, don't do it. Everything we do needs to be influenced and motivated by Jesus Christ. Amen. So now we've got a framework for how to live. We know what we should avoid. We know what we should keep away from. And now we know the alternative. If we are raised with Christ, then this is what it looks like. This is how you live it out. This is how you flesh it out. Amen. These are our PowerPoints for this evening. The first thing we talked about is setting our minds on things above. Colossians chapter 3, 1 through 4 tells us to focus on heavenly things, not earthly things, and remembering that we have been raised with Christ and that our life is hidden with Christ in God. And because of that, uh, we talked about putting to death earthly things. We need to put to death what is earthly in us, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed. We need to get rid of anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language, and not lie to one another, right? And then we need to, we talked about clothing ourselves with Christ-like virtues, uh, put on compassionate hearts with kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. We need to bear with one another and forgive one another. We need to put on love, which brings it all together. We need to let peace rule our hearts. We need to let uh, the word of Christ dwell in us richly. We need to encourage one another. We need to admonish one another. We need to fellowship and commune with one another. And whatever we do, whether we say it or whether we live it, we need to do it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. That is Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 through 17. I pray that. The Thank you for joining us today on PowerPoint Tuesday with Pastor Jeremiah. Remember, the word of God is a light unto your path. Until next time, stay blessed, stay inspired, and let God's wisdom guide you. This is Pastor Jeremiah saying, I love you, God loves you, keep yourselves in the love of God.